What we call in our modern psychological jargon the aha phenomenon. Uh, the aha phenomenon. Aha! Now I see. Well now, um, what was all this? This Zen is uh, a translation of the Sanskrit word jhana. And so this is being pronounced chan in Chinese and Zen in Japanese is unfortunately untranslatable in English. It designates a certain state of consciousness that is sometimes called meditation, but that won't do at all. Contemplation isn't really the point. Chinese have a different word for contemplation. And uh, sometimes one-pointedness of mind. I would prefer to translate this word with the notion of total presence of mind. When we say a person is crazy, we often say they're not all there. Now go to the opposite of that and visualize a person who is completely there or who is completely here. A person who lives totally and absolutely now. That doesn't mean he's incapable of thinking about the past or the future because thoughts about the past and about the future are included in the present. You have them now. But imagine the kind of person who is not distracted, who when he talks to you, it really gives you his whole being. Who doesn't, as it were, look over your shoulder and wander off to something else. Somebody who, first of all, he's completely here, and he's so much here that you can't phase him. Now, this idea of phasing is crucial in Zen. You see, I referred a moment ago to attachment, that Buddhism is living free from attachments. And I made the point that this is not abandoning a sense of a good appetite for dinner, but it's stopping sticking. In psychological jargon, you don't block. A mind of no hesitation, it's sometimes called. In Chinese, the phrase mo zhi chu is used of going straight ahead. So supposing somebody walks up to you on the street and says, are you saved? Now, most of us uh, who are intelligent people feel embarrassed by such a question. You know, what's this wretched Salvation Army person or Jehovah's Witness doing asking me whether I'm saved or not? And we're all a little bit, you know, what do you do with a nut like that? So, but as in Zen, this is a perfect moment to respond, see? To the most embarrassing question, are you saved? But Zen comes back in a very funny way. Uh, in Zen, uh, one doesn't give uh, philosophical answers to a question like that. You give practical answers. I had a boiled egg this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Because whenever you are asked about matters sacred, theoretical and philosophical, you answer in terms of things earthy and practical. But then on the other hand, when you are asked about things earthy and practical, you answer in terms of things religious and philosophical. <laughs> Is dinner ready? You know? Who's asking this question? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> So, this is then the flavor of Zen, is, you know, a Bodhidharma is supposed to have meditated so long that his legs fell off. <laughs> and he's usually drawn this way, something like this anyway. It looks like a shmoo. <laughs> but uh, in Japan, you buy these toys 
that are dharmas, and they are so weighted in here that you can never knock them over. You can bat it on the floor, bat it this way, bat it that way, but it always comes up again. And so the poem says, seven times down, eight times up, such is life. So uh, this is the, the, the principle of not being phased, not being attached. So to play the game, you can't phase me. Now, this is uh, very important in the art of lifemanship. <laughs> Fundamental gamesmanship. Because you see, when the Zen monks moved into Kyoto, uh, they took over the best part of town. It's simply fantastic how this happened. The beautiful hills were occupied by the brigands, who later became the Japanese nobility. Uh, the great daimyos, these were the toughest characters. And the Zen monks played a game with them, which was that, you know, you possess all these lands and you are powerful and so on, but so what? It's all falling apart. Then what will you do? Well, they said, that's too bad. We don't know. And the Zen monks said, oh, you haven't got the hang of the thing, you see. So they found that they couldn't terrify Zen monks. That uh, they played all sorts of tricks, but the Zen monks were better masters at it. See, supposing you say to somebody, uh, look, uh, I'm not afraid of you. You can do anything you like. You can kill me or anything at all. Well, if I go and kill the fellow who says this, I'll never find out whether he was afraid or not. <laughs> <laughs> so they outfaced these people and said, you, you, we have a secret, you see, that you don't have. And we'll teach your your uh, servitors to be great warriors because they'll learn the secret too and they won't be afraid of anything. And this is what they did. And so the daimyos, uh, the noblemen, uh, built great monasteries for these Zen masters and monks on their best land. The finest artists of Japan made gold leaf screens uh, for almost every room in the place. And although nobody owns anything individually, the community owns it collectively with the protection of the daimyos. And they had a tremendous scene going. <laughs> now, to us, that sounds extremely weird, even immoral. You don't expect religious people to do things like that. No, I know you don't, uh, if, if, if the religious people are self-righteous and have no humor. But these people didn't go around pretending that they were specially good. They didn't dupe themselves. They were people who understood what human nature is. That in every one of us, there is an element of irreducible rascality. In Jewish theology, this is called the Yetzahara. Uh, Y-E-Z-E-R-H-A-R-A. -E -E the Yetzahara. The element of irreducible rascality, which was created by God. Because God has one too. And uh, that's why when you are really affectionate with somebody else, when, for example, men, I don't know what women do in their private lives between each other, but men, uh, as we all know, say to someone they're very fond of, why, you old bastard, <laughs> you know? Uh, just like that, you know? There's a certain way of saying to a person, uh, there's a certain glint of recognition. And so there's a Zen poem which says, when two Zen masters meet each other on the road, they need no introduction. When a thief meets a thief, they recognize each other instantly. <laughs> and this goes back, you see, again, into the heart of Chinese philosophy. That human nature is considered to be basically good. And even the rascally elements of it are good. They are the sort of salt in the human stew. There has to be this little thing that human passions and that the, the natural uh, contentiousness and greed or whatever that we have is an essential element in our makeup. And that when people lose sight of that, they go mad. 
Nothing, for example, is more dangerous than a saint. That is to say, an unconscious saint who thinks that he is right and who endeavors to live an absolutely pure life and to eliminate all selfish thoughts. Somebody who undertakes that task is going to be a menace to all around because he loses his humor. He loses his real humility, which is knowing that after all, since we're humans, we have certain needs. We are, uh, need to eat, we need uh, sex, we need this, that, and the other. And this, this sort of has a, a, a quality of humor to it. And uh, so this is why in Zen art, the sages are always drawn to look a little bit like bums. You know that putai, or hote as he's called, what's called the laughing Buddha, the fat Buddha with an immense belly, uh, and carrying around an enormous bag of rubbish into which he indiscriminately puts anything he finds around and then gives it away to children. This is the sort of uh, type which the Chinese call the old rogue. And the old rogue, as a type of the poet, sage, monk, and scholar, you see, is greatly admired. He's the non-violent brigand, the rolling stone, the free man, or in our words, the joker. The joker, you see, is the card that can be, play any role in the pack. So then, Zen developed in China after Bodhidharma's time and came to a, a sort of golden age in the Tang and Sung dynasties. The golden age of Zen lies between 713 AD and approximately 1100, 1200. 11 to 1200. That's the great creative period in which all the marvelous masters emerged and during which Zen exercised a profound influence on the development of Chinese poetry and painting, calligraphy and scholarship. Then between 11 and 1200 uh, it shifted to Japan and uh, underwent a new development, rather different in quality and in tone. And after it had done that for some curious reason, which is a very complicated historical question, it slowly faded away in China. So that as we find it today, it is principally a Japanese phenomenon, and it is slowly fading in Japan and slowly growing in the West. It's a very funny thing. Now then, let me indicate what Zen training, what its method is. How does it work? I said before, what is involved is a dialogue, an interchange between two people. One who's defined himself as a student and has therefore defined the other as the teacher. There is no teacher until a student arrives, no problem until a question is raised. So students create teachers. If you ask a question, you get 30 blows with a stick. If you don't ask a question, you get 30 blows with a stick. Because you simply, you put yourself in statu pupillari. You've defined yourself as having a problem. Now nobody really has a problem. But the maya, the game of life, is to pretend that you do. Going back to fundamental Hinduism, the Godhead, or the self, pretends it's all of us, and so gets lost, and so has a ball, and dreams all this going on. So uh, when you're on your way out from the dream, it suddenly occurs to you that you have a problem. Life is suffering. Uh, you would like to get out of this. So 
one such student went to a Zen master and he said, we have to dress and eat every day. And how do we get out of all that? In other words, you might ask the question in this way. We have to work, get up Monday morning, go to the office, do all this routine, sell something and so on. How do we get out of the rat race? So we have to dress and eat every day, and how do we get rid of all that? And the master said, we dress, we eat. The student said, I don't understand. He replied, if you don't understand, put on your clothes and eat your food. No, this is the kind of dialogue so characteristic of Zen. So the position is this. The master, on being approached by a student about the problem of life, says, I have nothing to teach you. I am a Zen master. I have nothing to say. Zen is not words. And furthermore, everything is perfectly clear. There was a Confucian scholar who went to a Zen master and said, what is your secret teaching? And he replied, there is a saying in your own teacher Confucius which explains it all. Don't you remember when Confucius said to his disciples, do you suppose that I'm concealing something from you? I've held nothing back. And the scholar didn't get this. So a few days later, they were walking together in the mountains and they passed the wild laurel bush. And the Zen master said to the Confucian scholar, do you smell it? He said, yes. He said, you see, I'm holding nothing back. So the position of the Zen master is, there is nothing to tell you. There is no, we, we're not offering you any panacea, any solution, any doctrine, any big, big goody uh, to the problem of life because the problem is an illusion.